The universe is an extraordinary living being, a living process that is something like 13.8 billion years old. It's the largest possible design context for everything that we do. It's the most ancient design context. It gives us lessons about self-organization, emergence, relationality, connectivity, ancestry, lineage, this grand story that connects all of us together, all humans, all of our more than human kin, all of our living kin, and even the great mountain beings, the rivers, all the features of this living, breathing planet out to the other planets, out to the, the stars around us. And this is a nursery of stars. I just wanted to show you that the universe is alive. This is the Carina Nebula. And you can literally see these amazing formations where stars are coming into being and perhaps one day gathering around them solar systems of their own that perhaps may yield life. And on our fragile blue planet, third from the sun, way, way out, two thirds of the way out, in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, we have this extraordinary diversity, biological diversity and cultural diversity. And that nexus is sometimes called biocultural diversity. And there's a profound correlation. This map shows the darker areas have more plant diversity and the lighter spots show individual languages. And you can see these amazing juxtapositions uh, in the great Congo rainforest, for instance, extraordinary profusion of languages or in parts of the Amazon, right where there's plant diversity. This is the design context for our planet. Indigenous economics, we could date this perhaps to the San people in Southern Africa. They have been a culturally connected distinct group with oral traditions for 150,000 years. From the earliest times they were together as a people making a living in the very harsh but abundant environment of the Kalahari Desert. They had economies. They had economies based on trust, life-centered economies, economies of giving back to all living systems around them. It was a very advanced way to think about economics. And some of us are struggling to find language. Some of us struggle to call it something like regenerative economics or thriving or flourishing, the next iteration of ecological economics. But we have to honor the lineage that this is ancient. This is our most ancient home as a species. This is how we thrive. This is the birth of economics. That mountain is a sacred being. That is Mount Taranaki, Aotearoa, New Zealand. That is now a being with legal personhood. This just happened months ago. This being is not owned. This being is not property. This being by both Maori law and non-Maori law exists for its own purposes, for its own ends. It cannot be owned or controlled or bought or sold. This is a place that is very powerful for me. I spent time here with my family. This is the sacred valley of the Incas near Cusco, near Machu Picchu in Peru. These are three very powerful economic design terms from a very sophisticated economic worldview of the Quechua people. Aini is reciprocity over time and space and generations, relation. Ayu is Aini in community. So if you have right relationships and you can carry that out into a village or dozens of farms, hundreds of people, you can be an Ayu together. That is a very powerful way to think about economics. And Sumac Kausai is Ayu applied yet at another scale. You can apply it to an entire nation. It means happy, abundant, simple life, just joyful life, 
a sense of enoughness and creating that together in community through relation and through our relationships with all of life and living processes. That is Sumac Kausai. There are movements in Ecuador and Peru, other places to have this as a, a kind of national economic development framework, of course, contested with other visions of development and modernity. This is the PSAC site. We have to admit, we have to admit, this is the wrong self-organizing attractor. If we think about the global economic system, there is a periphery, there are parts of the world not completely caught in this massive vortex. And I'm using a tractor in a very technical sense in the discipline of complex systems, my particular Western knowledge lineage, an attractor brings in points from all around and we're stuck in an attractor. Think of it as this vortex that just sucks it in. It is so hard to create energies that aren't brought in and sucked into this attractor. And it's been building with force and power and intensity and sweeping up communities and forests and water all over the world. It's been going on for a very long time, but I list four critical dates that we all have to acknowledge as part of this attractor, as part of the undoing of this attractor. We need this knowledge. Large-scale colonization, many people date it to the early voyages of Christopher Columbus, voyages of conquest and terror beginning in 1492. The Westphalian system to resolve many decades of conflict in Europe an agreement to sort of give nation states sovereignty. And I remind you that sovereignty is Mount Taranaki. Sovereignty is life. Sovereignty is the flow of life in the universe. And it's not an abstract concept of political boundaries. Neoclassical economics, circa 1870s, and of course the Bretton Woods agreements that laid the framework for our global financial system. We need to nurture hundreds of life-centered economic attractors. The counterpoint to that one vast attractor bringing in everything, each of these salmon, each of these sockeye salmon, imagine flowing. Each one of those is flowing towards new possibilities, flowing towards a bioregional, a watershed-driven economy. We need to open the design space for economics to what the San people have been doing for 150,000 years. What regions all over the world are experimenting with. This is a world map that shows the flow of water. These are huge watersheds, each different color. And those beautiful lines, those arteries of water, those are watersheds. You can see a huge purple watershed in the Amazon basin. These are the flows of life. And this is the pluriverse. Each of these regions represents an ecologically and culturally coherent part of the world with its own distinct ways of being and worldviews. And the pluriverse is just that sense of infinite incommensurability that there can be different languages, different values, different perspectives, different ways of even beginning an imagination of an economy, even beginning the design process for an economy. And we can rebuild autonomy and sovereignty for these co-created, co-designed local economies within the pluriverse. The natural units of this regeneration are manifold, whatever captures people's imagination, where they are, watersheds, food sheds, fiber sheds, indigenous territories, cultural landscapes, bioregions, biomes, ecoregions, mountains, lakes, islands, archipelagos, endless, but starting with the actual life of the world. So I propose three 
ways out of that terrible global attractor that we're in. These are practical. These are happening now. These can gain force all over the world. It begins with intention, supporting bioregions and indigenous nations as they spontaneously co-design more beautiful economic attractors that are consistent with their own lived context. With the Buckminster Fuller Institute, we're a 40-year-old nonprofit. We've been devoted to systemic innovation this whole time. And we are forming a global alliance. We'll be announcing it very soon with a way to help with that intentionality, to support watersheds, bioregions, indigenous nations in this very, very rich systemic design process, right? Systemic design, but within these different biocultural contexts, all the way from understanding the geospatial realities on the landscape, developing strategic vision, understanding critical regenerative solution sets around energy, decarbonization, water, all of those kinds of practical things, working with what's happening on the ground with regenerators, with land stewards, land defenders, where they are helping nourish their enterprises, helping connect them to investment that's not extractive, aggregating their work, accelerating it, making it visible, and then connecting it to capital in the right way. And then continuing the cycle. You don't have to choose all the perfect investments in the first year. You just begin to build this kind of relationality and capacity, perhaps with an indigenous knowledge systems lab, like my colleagues in Australia are developing. And then you learn governance over time gets stronger and more place-based. You follow cycles of implementation, adaptive management, and MRV, measurement reporting verification. Second, we need the transition. Imagine every territory, every bioregion standing up that intentionality, knowing what it wants, just needing the flows to be unstuck. So we can co-design rapid pathways to transition economic assets towards these regenerative bioregional economies. And it's a flow from that 500 plus year global default economic attractor from nation states to indigenous territories, bioregions, islands. The SDGs are wonderful and let's also complement them with grassroots up regenerative development goals that are actually determined locally, implemented locally from one unified Bretton Woods system to diverse bioregional banks and funds all over the world that federate, that join together when needed to provide support instead of high interest loans when another region is in difficulty. Uh, developing regenerative trade so that you can't even clear flows of currency from one bioregion to another unless there's a regenerative integrity in that transaction. Three, alignment with life building a supportive post Bretton Woods global financial architecture. We need this. We can't stay in that terrible attractor that I showed you earlier. We need a new financial architecture that foregrounds planetary health at multiple levels of scale and follows the contours of life itself. We are creating an approach based on bioregional financing facilities led by an amazing company called Finance for Gaia with partners including Dark Matter Labs, a global leader in policy innovation, One Earth, a global leader in geospatial mapping, the Biome Trust, New Zealand-based foundation. The goal is to re-envision the global financial architecture so that it may be in the service of life. First phase is a research paper making the case for the urgent development and piloting of a bioregional financing facility, which every bioregion on earth could quickly launch. So we're nourishing this work at Buckminster Fuller Institute as one of our open innovation ecosystems. There are many efforts all over the world along these lines. These are ideas whose time has come. And this is not about being original. It's just connecting to the universe, connecting to, to nature, to living systems, borrowing that knowledge temporarily and passing it back to the world. 
we have to act and you have to act as if it is possible to change the world and you have to do it all the time. Angela Davis, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Next is Dr. Miles Sargent. Here, there you are. Save your questions, jot them down. We will be having a discussion after. That was a beautiful talk. I really enjoyed that. And I must say, I'm a little jealous. Uh, as a family doc, how can I weave in the birth of stars into my talks? Uh, basically, I'm skipping from 13.8 billion years ago to 10 years ago. I mean, it's anyway, so <laughs> anyhow, so I'm Miles. I am a family doctor and um, I've always been interested in environmental issues. About 10 or 12 years ago, I was working in one of the clinics I worked in, which uh, was a shelter for homeless people. And it was a very, very hot day. Um, and I knew that when I was done in the clinic, I was gonna go home to my little farm where there's lots of trees and we have air conditioning. And I also knew that the guys I was taking care of we're going to be staying there. Um, and that made me change my path uh, to a degree. And then I started, uh, I started tree charity. We started planting trees around Hamilton, similar to LEAF, which is an organization in Toronto. I would say it's a similar organization. So we plant trees at health facilities. And I teach medical students and residents about tree planting. We go out, you know, planting trees here and there. So I do have an interest in biodiversity, but I also have an interest in carbon mitigation, which is such a massive problem now. Um, so this one is where we've come in the last 40 years. This is a graph which shows the futuristic mapping of where global CO2 might go. Uh, it starts in 1990 at about 40 gigatons per year that we produce and goes up to 50 gigatons by 2020. There was a bit of a stall, as we know, during COVID. And then these are the various pathways you could follow. And you hear a lot about the 1.5 degree pathway being so important. I added the red line to show where we need to go in the next seven or eight years. So it's not just that we need to get down to zero by 2050, we need a sharp decline in the next seven years. I am an optimist, I, I think we can do it. And there's some reasons I think we can do it. Canada, of course, is a big CO2 emitter. We buy a lot of stuff, we're a wealthy nation. Uh, you can see the wealthy nations at the top. These are not all the nations of the world, it's sort of a smattering of nations here. Some people say, well, Canada's cold, that's part of the problem, but you can see Sweden much further down the list. Uh, and then the countries which we now refer to as the global south, having hardly any impact uh, per capita. So we need to do a lot better. And what is interesting within healthcare is we see the impacts of climate change in terms of human health, in terms of Obviously in Canada this year, people being exposed to smoke from forest fires. And in Nova Scotia this year, there were three climate disasters, flood, hurricane, fire. 
we're seeing more and more of this and all of the impacts in terms of uh, what we call vector-borne diseases like the ticks moving further north or mosquito diseases, et cetera. So we see all of that as physicians and yet we are a part of the problem. So I show here, the footprint of healthcare in Canada is about 5% of the entire footprint of everything we do in Canada, industry and personally which is actually more than the airline industry. So we need to do better within healthcare. Ultimately, in any place, if you wanna make change, you should develop a culture of sustainability. We do need to do that in healthcare, but there is a time issue. There is an urgency. We have a climate crisis. So we went about this a different way. I'm talking about PEACH, which was introduced earlier. PEACH stands for partnerships for environmental action by clinicians and communities for health facilities. This just started two years ago, unfortunately not 13 billion years ago, just two years ago that we started looking at this and thinking, how can we do this quickly if we don't have much time? And so I think the obvious thing was to reach out to the people around the province in healthcare who are already doing wonderful things. And there's lots of examples, whether it's a food manager or a facilities engineer, we reached out to them and said, what are you doing and how can we leverage this across our sector? This is how we broke down our sector in terms of the, the initiatives that we need to take and the areas that we need to go after to make our healthcare systems sustainable. We had a young architect draw what might be the ideal green facility and there, all those eight elements are in that drawing. Of course, you know, an ideal green facility could look any number of ways. And also these issues that we look at in healthcare, if you take out drugs and devices are the same issues that you're looking at in most industry. So leadership, clearly, if you're gonna make great changes, leadership needs to be involved. I was involved with a, a grassroots green team at the hospital I work with. We've been together for five years. We do have lots of fun. We plant trees, we put in pollinator gardens. We've done some recycling projects. Unfortunately, we cannot do the big things that need to be done unless senior management has bought in. And so you do need to have a strategy. I work at Hamilton Health Sciences. Hamilton Health Sciences, I could now add to that list of three hospital systems there. We do now have a, a fourth pillar of excellence, which is sustainability. These three organizations, UHN Toronto, CHEO in Ottawa, Sunnybrook in Toronto, have different ways that they go about it, but they do have strategies and they have a person responsible. So one thing we did for leadership is we made this guidebook for hospital leaders. And it's a, you know, everybody wants an infographic now, uh, which is essentially something you would want to read in grade three or four. There's the the font is big, there's lots of pictures, but that's what people want. So here it is. It doesn't look like much, but we put a lot of thought into this. This is essentially the 22 biggest items you can do in a hospital system to decrease carbon. And the point I make when I'm talking to hospital uh, leadership is that it's not all about buildings and energy up there in the upper right, which is where our minds tend to go, buildings and energy. It involves supply chain in a big way. It does involve food, it involves all of these different areas. So there's a role to play for everyone in the hospital. <laughs> we also developed this, uh, what we call our low hanging knowledge translation tree or low hanging uh, peach tree, of course, because we're peach. There are actually three colors of fruit on this tree. And uh, I'm just showing you the orange ones. The orange ones are what our knowledge translation lead calls the game changers. These all have over 100 tons of CO2 per year in a 200 bed hospital. So these are the ones that you wanna go after. And the reason we did this was to demonstrate that some of the go-to items, so if you are a person working at a hospital and you wanna make change and you wanna do something better for the environment, some of the obvious things would be recycling, which is important, but it, it's not even on our top 20 list and EV vehicles. That would be another one often because management drives EV vehicles. So they want to have the chargers at the hospital, but they are a green fruit. They're one of the smaller fruits. So these are the big, the big ones. And uh, you could see around here that 
We also have a logarithmic cost scale. So building a whole new uh, net zero building, $500 million or more upgrading your boilers. So these are some of the uh, building energy things which cost a lot, but most of these, and the point is that most of these are either cost neutral or cost saving. Uh, decarbonizing your investments or divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, hospitals often have hundreds of millions of dollars in their foundations and what are they invested in? Uh, green procurement, I'll talk quite a bit about that. Switching more to plant rich diets for patients. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about having a vegan hospital. Someone actually did try that in Ontario about 10 or 12 years ago, a colleague of mine, he almost got run out of town. It was a farm community. Um, so they, they softened the, you know, the, the approach and it's, uh, you know, they're still doing this. It's more of a, a heart friendly diet, but has a lot more uh, plant rich items. And then there's a couple of medication things on the bottom here. So, so this is what we did. I think I only have 20 minutes, so I'm not going to go through these in detail, but we did think through in each case, how do you actually compare a plant rich diet to riding a bike to having a, a new boiler and we, we, we thought that through like what practically would a hospital do in each case how much would it cost and how much greenhouse gas would it save and we basically listed these in this um, article from from top down none of these big things happen without a leadership strategy education within healthcare, we are taught to choose wisely this is something that came about a, about 10 or 12 years ago not every person with back pain, for example, needs an x-ray. And we know from the evidence when we should be doing an x-ray and when we shouldn't be doing an x-ray. And that's where the whole choosing wisely thing came about. But choosing wisely lends itself perfectly to sustainability because every single test we do, every x-ray, every blood work we send you for does come with a carbon footprint. So we do need to think about it from that perspective. Um, so we did look at some of the individual items, a CBC, a complete blood count. I'm sure you've all had one. How much does that save? If we, I think, I think we chose about a 10% reduction in CBCs ordered per year at a hospital. It saves over $100,000. It is a small fruit, half a ton of CO2. Uh, decreasing the number of MRIs you do, MRIs have a bigger impact. Um, so the UK is considered to be ahead of the rest of the world in this sphere. Uh, they've been doing this sort of thing for about 12 years now. Two years ago in The Lancet, they published this article, which looked just at their healthcare system and the carbon imprint of their healthcare system. They looked at ambulances, dental offices, primary care offices, hospitals. This is all blended in together to show what, what are the big impacts? And what's interesting to me here is that personal travel, and we think so much about travel in the last 40 years, in riding our bikes, buying EV cars, it's only 10% of this pie. And this is visitors, staff, and patients. So it's 10% of the pie. We need to get everything down to zero. So this is still important. The red piece of the pie is essentially is what we call um, scope one, it's what's happening inside the building and building energy, which I've talked a little bit about is only 10% of the pie at eight o'clock. So most of this is what they call scope three, which is the supply chain. It is the things we buy. And when I first saw this, it kind of blew my mind. And you think about the hospital and everything going on in the hospital, it's actually the stuff being processed, produced outside the hospital, being brought in, used, and sent out again, which is the biggest uh, piece of the pie. So this is the supply chain. I think you probably all know the four R's. We emphasize the first one, which is refuse, which is to refuse the bad products. Um, I could talk about circular economy and the difference between a reusable gown and a throw, throwaway gown. We use a lot of throwaway gowns, but every throwaway gown has to be dug out of the ground and then shipped to manufacturing, manufactured, shipped to packaging, packaged, shipped to the hospital. I might use it for 60 seconds, depending on what you're doing. Then you throw it out. And of course there are washable gowns that can be washed up to 200 times before they're not considered. So that, that is what we're talking about the circular economy within, within all sectors, but certainly within healthcare. 
So what can we do about that? Um, so I spoke to the sustainable procurement experts in Canada and said, what can we do within healthcare? They said, there's two things you need to do. One is to send a message, a signal to industry to tell industry that we now within healthcare want green products. So that's number one. Number two is that when you are scoring products, for example, Ontario bought 200 or sorry, bought 20 MRI machines in the past six months or so. Had this been in place, we wouldn't just be looking at which companies are giving us the best quality and the best cost. We would also look at our, is your MRI machine sustainable? Can it be refurbished? Can it be used again in some way, right? That needs to be part of the formula. And the good news is uh, we created a committee in Ontario uh, of the, a lot of the procurement leads and some VPs and uh, actually Supply Ontario was at that committee as well. And Hamilton Health Sciences did send that letter out to 1200 vendors in May and did do their first contract a month ago uh, on green procurement. And this is the one that brings me hope because it does impact the entire world the way we know products are made. This happens to be a, a slide from Copenhagen Business School, really looking at, at the disruptions in supply chain, but it also suits my agenda. It shows, for example, um, one pathway, number one in Chile, all the raw materials then shipped over to Southeast Asia, number two, then north into China, number three, and then for final assembly, then back across to Mexico, up to Canada. Um, we actually just did a study with some engineers at McMaster looking at the at the journey of a pill, and it and we'll publish this soon. It will blow your mind. Sticking with computers, everyone uses computers. There are actually ways you can look at how green a company is. And CDP, Carbon Disclosure Project, has been around since 2000. Hardly anybody knows about these. Uh, these not-for-profits that look at companies. There's also uh, corporate knights in Canada that look at companies and how green they are and they rate them. Um, there are now over 20,000 companies in the world which are disclosing uh, their carbon footprint, their water footprint, and their forest footprint. So we've talked about supply chain. It is a massive one. I'm speeding along here because it's a shorter talk. Drugs and devices, there are certain medication we prescribe that have emissions within their use. Uh, I'll just focus on anesthetic gases here. Desfluorine is an anesthetic gas 2200 times worse than carbon dioxide. We don't actually need to use it. Some of the, the anesthetists are starting to ban it in their hospitals. I think there's probably eight hospitals now in Ontario that have banned it. Um, so that's some of the numbers around desfluorine. It did end up being one of the orange fruits at 318 tons uh, per year for that size hospital. Uh, buildings and energy. There are still some things that we can do for buildings and energy to make things better. One thing, for example, operating rooms uh, need to be run with 20 cycles of air uh, per hour to avoid infections. You don't need to do that overnight, most hospitals do. Food, if you have ever looked at Project Drawdown, which looks at the biggest solutions in the world, the solutions that are possible in the next 30 years, uh, really interesting to look at. It from top to bottom in terms of the biggest solutions, the two biggest solutions are both within food, uh, plant-rich menus and decreasing waste. And the same is true within hospitals. Um, some hospitals are doing what they call room service now, particularly the pediatric hospitals, where instead of giving you three meals a day, whether you're feeling up to it or not, you order your meal. And you only get your meal if you order it. And I work in a geriatric hospital, and I'll go in and see my patient, and I'll see the meal sitting there. I mean, so, so, you know, in our meals in hospitals travel 4,500 kilometers from field to plate because we get a lot of our food from California. Uh, so, I mean, it's just an incredible the amount of food waste we have and it's unnecessary. Um, this is why we talk about plant-rich menus. This um, I'm sure a lot of you've seen before, the uh, kilograms of CO2 per food type that we're eating here. So a serving of beef, clearly much, much higher, some of the other dairy products, and then down into the vegetables. 
Uh, transportation, we, obviously we started doing virtual medicine during COVID and uh, there are a ton of benefits to virtual medicine. I had poison ivy on my face a couple of years ago. And I just took a picture, sent it to my family doc and he said, yes, you need steroids for that. Um, I didn't have to drive anywhere, which and I, didn't, I didn't have to wait in the waiting room either. Uh, just because I'm a doc doesn't mean I don't have to wait in the waiting room. You still have to wait in the waiting room. So if we could continue to do this in a safe way, we need to continue doing this. And the other thing I always uh, advocate for is the virtual option at conferences. So this is a conference that happened in England a few years ago. They uh, did a study, it was a pharmaceutical conference. And these are North Americans that on the left in pink uh, flew over to the conference. And then the North Americans on the right in green who did the conference from home on their internet. Uh, staying at home was 10 kilograms of CO2 for the weekend. Flying over was 1900 roughly. And you can see the impact of the plane there. I'm not saying don't fly because I still fly. I, I don't fly as much as my family would like, but I, I still do fly. I'm just saying we, we need to push for these sorts of options. And finally, getting back to the biodiversity where I, I started in this journey before we did the peach project, we have tried to push the trees for Hamilton idea out to other places. And so I did partner with all these groups so this is now a provincial project planting trees at hospitals and healthcare facilities around Ontario. This is a summary of the things on the tree basically and how much savings per year and how much greenhouse gas per year can be saved if you do those initiatives. And I like to show this one because I think there's a myth that sustainability costs too much. We can't afford to do it a sustainable way but we can, we can save a lot of money. So climate action, who's responsible? There's a lot of finger pointing and a lot of different uh, places that could take this on. And of course the answer is we're all responsible. We all need to step up at our homes and our offices. Uh, and within healthcare, we are considered anchor institutions. Um, as I was introduced, I am the, the lead now for the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. We see this in a way that goes beyond the hospital in terms of healthcare. Uh, doctors, nurses, OTs, pharmacists. We are a trusted voice in society and we do need to send this message. Um, and, and also we need to recognize how much our healthcare sector interacts with the rest of society. We are buyers, manufacturers up there in the top right. We can work with in local innovators. We can work with local farmers and get food more uh, readily. So there's many, many ways the healthcare sector can be, can be doing this work. And um, finally, in terms of the future of healthcare, we're still bu building mega hospitals. Um, we did a study, this is in preprint, hasn't been published yet. We looked at hospitals versus long-term care versus home care in terms of kilograms of CO2 per day per bed. So if you're in hospital, it's about 30 kilograms of CO2 per bed per patient day. And, and the other piece of this is that most Canadians want to die at home. Something like 80, 85% of Canadians want to die at home. They don't want to die in hospital, but 60% of Canadians die in hospital. So this is a this is a system problem that we have, not having enough long-term care beds, not having enough home care. We're just showing the green angle on this. Getting from hospital to long-term care drops from 30 kilograms a day down to less than nine. Getting people back home for home care is, is less than two. So we, we need to make big changes. And here is the entire peach tree, but I am now passing the torch. I'll await your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you so much. Great slides. Wow. Wonderful. So our final speaker before we have our discussion and pull this all together is Dr. Simran Singh.
Okay, thank you, um, organizers, for having me um, here at this event. It's really a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the previous two speakers for inspiring me as well. And I can see some connections. I like to make links. And I'll be talking about the metabolism of islands, you know, and uh, it's quite daunting to talk about metabolism when there is a medical doctor in the room. <laughs> and so I hope you can help me uh, understand if I'm on the right track. So um, I've been working uh, with small islands for, I would say, a couple of decades now. And people ask uh, often, why islands? Why I got interested in islands? And so I'll spare you of the more amusing part of the answer. Um, uh, but I, uh, I can say that my journey with islands began um, with the Nicobar Islands, which are uh, close to Sumatra. They, they belong to India, uh, but they are much closer to Indonesia. And I spent over a decade, uh, let's say, doing field work. Um, and these are remote islands which are which are protected, um, you know, kind of out of bounds, so it's not easily accessible, or you don't get permission to go there because of high security. But it's a group of islands where you have a lot of ind you know, indigenous people living, um, and and so I I did a lot of field work there, and um, these islands really shaped. Um, my thinking, my, my life and my professional life as well, and the questions I, I asked today. So, um, and so much so that I've, I've written a lot of uh, works on the Nicobar Islands and about two books and more than 20 articles, I would say. And I was interviewed in science as well uh, about my work on, the, on these islands. And there's even a, uh, 82 minute, uh, uh, you know, a, a full length documentary that was made on my work on these islands and which have been shown at film festivals all over the world and also special screenings. And uh, we have uh, also positive review in nature. So hopefully you have a chance to watch this documentary at some point. So I will not be talking about uh, the Nicobar Islands as much. I like to tell the story of the Nicobar Islands, but I won't be doing that today. But um, this work, as I said, impacted me greatly in my thinking. And I went on to found a research program called the Metabolism of Islands. And so this is the page and um, I'm going to explain this work and uh, what I am doing currently. So, so why islands? So here is the boring part of the explanation. Um, so islands are home to about 10% of the world's population. And so we might not be aware of that. Uh, and one in four countries are islands or archipelagos. This is 25%. This is a, a huge number. So to be represented in the UN. And if you also look at the area, they are nearly 7% of the Earth's terrestrial area. But if you count the, the economic zones that the oceans around that, they have one sixth of the Earth's total area. That means so many people depend uh, on islands and the oceans around them. This is, this is, this is kind of significant. And the hotspots of biodiversity, um, uh, where kind of 20% of all plant, bird, and reptile species found globally. And a lot of extinctions are also happening on islands, so, so highly kind of threatened. At the same time, islands face an existential crisis. We hear in the news constantly about you know hurricanes and you know climate sea, sea level rise and um, so uh, so a, so a lot of climate impacts are are happening on on island communities. So they are the least responsible. So it's an environmental justice issue as well. They are the least responsible. When I say SIDS, I mean the small island developing states. These are uh, the it's a UN category, and they emit less than one percent uh, greenhouse gases collectively but they're highly impacted, they're kind of disproportionately impacted. Being very kind of tightly coupled systems, uh, what happened, even a small event, like, like you know, if there's a flooding or um, uh, you know, if there is a hurricane, it is not unusual for the whole island to shut down. You know? Like everything comes to a standstill because of the tight coupling of the social and ecological systems. So when hurricane, you know, Maria, happen in the Caribbean hurricanes, you, you, you hear that the entire country comes to a standstill. So, uh, so that's very, uh, so, that's, so that's a high impact. 
And then it sets a series of cascading impacts with taking huge amounts of loans and for reconstruction, handling disaster waste. Um, so, uh, you know, rebuilding, it's, uh, it, it is very resource intensive. Being small economies, like small, like small spaces, they have also limited resources. They have also limited possibility to absorb waste. Uh, so a lot of the waste that is generated on islands stay on the islands. Um, and they have limited means to develop economies of scale, meaning that it's cheaper to import things than to produce your own, oftentimes because of, of the market. And, and so uh, they oftentimes fall into single economies like tourism or sugarcane or oil. So they get into these metabolic traps that I will talk about where they become more vulnerable to global shocks. Um, a damaged infrastructure will result in services loss and huge amount of disaster waste and kind of it's very costly for reconstruction. Oftentimes the losses are many more times the GDP, like 200% or 300% of the GDP. So this is a uh, huge uh, amounts of uh, resources that are required for, you know, for, for rebuilding. So what I do is I use island as an organism uh, analogy and to conduct social metabolic research. So let me explain that a bit more. So islands like any living organism. So the example I give here is of a, of a cow, but can be any living organism, uh, human bodies. Uh, so islands also metabolize resources. They have an input and they have an output. So they have inflows and outflows. And uh, many of the, um, the flows like from inflows to outflows, they happen very quickly like food. Uh, but there is a lot of flows that actually stay on in the socioeconomic system or an island, which is uh, used to actually create, maintain, or operate stocks. When I say stocks, I mean infrastructure. So building a road or any you know kind of health facility or or housing or or any kind of uh, other uh, other industrial parks. So a lot of the materials that is enters the island or socioeconomic system actually stays on the island for longer periods of time. And, um, and, and these stocks or infrastructure is not built because we don't know what else to do with our flows. It's built to provide critical services to society, like roads are built for transport, or you, know, you build a hospital to provide healthcare facilities. Um, and so each of those infrastructure is giving critical uh, human services or societal services. So, so, so in, in short, a social metabolic flows create, operate, and maintain society's material stocks that give uh, or provide you know, critical services. So this is just a style, stylized model of a, of a, you know, of a social metabolic uh, you know, stock and flow of an island. And all the arrows that you see here can be quantified through different methods, uh, which I won't go into details here, but there are methods that allow us to quantify and looks at the stock flow service dynamics. So to break it down in a very, very simple way, if any one of you forgets this, then all you have to remember is input, um, the, the put, put, and output. Uh, I don't know why this is always jumping here, but anyhow, so that's the very basic way. So we understand input, we understand output, but very important is put put. So, and the problem is there is just too much put put. So, and the put put determines the input and the output. So now you're asking, what is this put put? You know, and uh, so let me explain the put put because that's extremely important um, for input and output. So as economies develop, they stimulate the demand for services. So let's say an island, you know, becomes very popular, you know, tourist destination or, or discovers oil or, or certain some other industry. Um, they have money and there is a demand for high quality services, better roads, better airports, you know, better housing, better healthcare, you know, better universities. So you need better services. And these services are, um, which we call kind of put put, is provided by stocks. So you need infrastructure to deliver um, those services. It cannot be delivered just by themselves. So you need to build infrastructure. And this infrastructure requires a lot of flows. So I'll give you an example of Mali, 
the Maldives. So you see a picture in 1950, you see the land use and you see the level of infrastructure. So that's the level of putput you can say, you know? And on the right side, you see, is, you see the putput that has changed because Mauritius becomes a very attractive destination for tourism, for diving. Um, and you see the flows are very different. So if you have a, you know, a put put like in 1950, you need very little flows to maintain, operate those stocks. But if you have infrastructure like today, you need a lot of more energy materials, water to actually maintain that. And this islands are growing through a crisis. So we are actually studying uh, Maldives at the moment. So from a systems perspective, there is a kind of, kind of dynamic feedback between stock flow and services. And, uh, and this is a system approach. So you will see this kind of cycle that goes, so the more the need for services, the more for need for stocks, the more you need the flows. And the more the flows, again, you know, it boosts the economy and you have higher GDP and then you need you know, more services. So this goes into a system that um, can look like this, that goes over time, you know, the footprint increases and the input output also increase comes to a point, uh, we can call them tipping point and collapse. So what is happening in this system is we are accumulating what is called social metabolic risk. And uh, the risk is, is very similar to human bodies. Like if I went to Mike and Mike looked at my metabolism and he looked at got some blood work or some reports, he would say, well, you know, my friend, you know, your metabolism is not very good. So if you continue that way, you, you could be ready for some, some heart surgeries or some kind of organ replacement in 10 years, or you have chance of heart attack is increasing over time. Uh, you have options. You can either change your metabolism, your lifestyle, or you can have this box of pills and have them for the rest of your life, or you are ready for some organ replacement in the future. So you have different options. So what we're doing is we are, through our metabolism, we are accumulating risk uh, over time. And this risk can, make you either, uh, you know, they can make you vulnerable as, as we grow. So um, what we can say is the social metabolic risk is to islands as circulatory health problems are to humans. Both constrain the entity's ability to withstand shock. So if you have an, a weak metabolism or, or, or unhealthy metabolism in the body, we are vulnerable to more disease, uh, to changes in the environment. Uh, you know, we get sick faster. So, um, so, so same thing with islands, we can see already socioeconomic system is that maladaptive practices or in, you know, insensitive developed practices that, that we have observed on islands, uh, they are actually magnifying islands climate vulnerability. So that's the kind of thinking uh, we use for our, uh, for our work. So I will just skip this because it is just defining what I had just explained. I would jump to examples of, uh, of you know, kind of metabolic risk with, uh, in the Caribbean, just I use it two or three examples. So let's look at Grenada. So Grenada, you know, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a lovely island. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if you go as a tourist, but if you, if you go with my thinking, I don't really enjoy the islands because I only see problems. So, so what I see is, uh, um, you can see this map of Grenada and uh, the red, areas that you see are the hot, these are where the stocks, the material stocks are concentrated, the infrastructure. So you see, you will see, anyone can tell that the concentration is the southwest of the island. So when I was um, showing this to, uh, to policymakers, I was doing a talk in, in Grenada and I, and, I, and, I, and I showed this, it didn't take long to figure out that this was a very vulnerable place because this is on the, path of hurricanes, you know? So whenever there is, it doesn't happen every year, but whenever there is extreme event, this part is affected. So you don't need rocket science to, to, to tell what's going to happen uh, to your services. So you see how much of the services are uh, exposed. You can see, you know, in that area. So, um, and with very, very simple, um, we did us, you know, one meter sea level rise, we saw how much of the stocks or services was at risk. So you can see tourism was at the highest risk followed by industrial and then residential. So you can, when, when you're able to quantify the concentration of infrastructure, we can convert this into services. 
societal services, economic services, and we can also put a dollar value to say how, how much it will impact the economy under certain conditions of sea level rise or hurricanes or, or flooding. So uh, now when I showed this graph, many people get very confused. This is a resource flow graph. You will see different types of materials. Uh, so you have the non-metallic minerals on the top right, then you have the timber. So all of those, normally when you, when you would look at the trends of resource use, uh, in mainland societies, there is a very interesting reinforcing curve or, or a curve that is gently increasing over time, like, or maybe mostly like hockey sticks, you know, that kind of curve. But when you look at islands, you see the spikes. This is very typical of island systems. And when I show it to non-islanders, they don't understand how this is possible. But when I show this on an island, people immediately say, yes, we had a hurricane here, we had a disaster here. This is a cycle of construction and reconstruction. It doesn't take a lot of insight for islanders to figure out why they see spikes. And all of those spikes you have to import, reconstruct, you have disaster waste. So, um, and, and Caribbean is one of the regions that are huge debt, you know, economic debt because of this kind of cycles. So my second example is food system. So Caribbean imports 83% of their, of their food requirements uh, in kind of dollar value, but this was not always the case. So look at this graph. This is a physical trade balance graph. So in the middle is a zero. And when you look at before 1975, you see the, the flows which are below the zero. It shows that the Caribbean was a net exporter of food. So Caribbean was exporting food before the, 1970, before the 1970s. And over time through trade agreements and how they shift economies, they are net importers of food. So this is showing a a, you know, a tipping point that happened through agreements and decisions, policy decisions, where the system tipped from being food secure, from, uh, from being a food exporter to being a food, a food, uh, food exporter. So I have, I have done a more detailed uh, presentation on this uh, for, 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 for Neil Arya, <laughs> I should mention, who is a friend of Mike here, where I link this type of uh, kind of uh, like biomass metabolism to, uh, to health that is uh, in, yeah, in the Caribbean. So, but that is not, not for today. Um, so, but what happened with the shock, with the COVID shock, you see uh, there was a, a massive survey uh, in 2021 20, and twice in 2022. Uh, we have very interesting results because of their food dependency. You will see, just I want to highlight two points that um, when the COVID started and towards the tail end of the COVID, you saw they were like almost 40% of the people said they were hungry, but did not eat, right? This is a very high proportion of the population. And the other one uh, you can say said, my household ran out of food. You see how uh, that was over 40%. And, and then over 60% people said, I was unable to eat healthy and nutritious food. So you can see the impact of the, the food metabolism of the food system how that would uh, manifest itself uh, in a crisis like the COVID-19. So now let's look at the output. We talked about the input uh, and now look at the output. So Caribbean islands generate more than double electronic waste per capita as the global average, because uh, you know, uh, very low quality um, uh, electronic products end up uh, because transportation co costs are higher. So you know, goods that don't have a long life end up basically selling there, or even secondhand goods come there, like a lot of secondhand cars come to Caribbean from Japan, which then they are waste after a couple of years. So you have a lot of waste cars that are just a pile somewhere, or used tires after a few years, huge, you know, and they put fire to those. So, uh, so, so this is a problem where you see, this is uh, uh, with electronic waste. So it's a very linear system uh, of metabolism. Um, and, and, and looking at Grenada alone, you can see this is again a linear system. You see almost 50,000 tons of waste ends up on the island. Now transporting waste outside the island is very expensive. You can't take it out. And leaving it on the island is no better because of space constraints. And so there is landfills, but uncontrolled kind of landfills. Oftentimes the waste are in you know, poor neighborhoods or, at, or, or in the coastal areas. Where, where there is no tourism development. So all of that waste, which is harmful, ends up kind of um, like polluting the oceans or, or their very limited space. 
So yes, so, and again, the per capita waste generation is much higher because, uh, and, and tourism is, is also a factor in that. Um, so my final example is the Bahamas. You can see this is the material flow, the metabolic uh, flows uh, of the Bahamas. The main message here I want to show is less than 1% is recycled, right? Less than 1% of the, of, the, of the outflows actually re-enters the economy. Now, the, the global economy, the global average, we say the world is 7.6% circular according to the latest report. 7.6, not, not, that's not great either. 7.6 is still very, very poor, but from most islands we have studied is less than 1%. So um, that is a big difference. So with Bahamas, we have looked at the cascade effects and stuff like that. So I will not go into this, but I just want to mention one example of the dependency on the fuels uh, and, and on, the, uh, on the imports of the energy system. So you see that when you are high reliance on energy systems, there is, you know, the risk is the prices can fluctuate and that makes everything expensive on the island. But they can also be oil spills like Hurricane Dorian came um, uh, you know, in 2019 and there was a big oil spill. And this oil spill, uh, because extreme events are so frequent on small island that if you have to reserve or you know, have these kind of oils, which are uh, you know, kind of, uh, let's say kind of stored, they can be damaged and imagine the kind of damage in oceans and, and the ecosystem. So this has really happened not too long ago in, in the Bahamas and the cascade effects are, are, are significant that goes uh, into, uh, into the economy, in, in, into the energy system, into the labor and all the cost of cleaning up. So that's just one example of cascades and, and risk on the Bahamas. So what can, we, what can we do? So small is beautiful. So this is, a, I, I bring you back from the universe to a small island. And this is, as you know, Schumacher, has written this book, Small is Beautiful. So what can we learn from islands? And this is not very different from what Stuart, you know, uh, your, your point number two from the three that he says. So I, will, I, I think I will repeat some of that, but islands have a methodological utility. So we, I think they're quite interesting geographies to understand system dynamics. So, and how risks are accumulated. So we are learning a lot about <laughs> tight coupling of systems and cascades and tipping points, which is, is fascinating from an academic perspective. But they also have a huge potential of being hubs of innovation because of the urgency. Now, you don't need any explanation to an islander that climate change is a problem. It is a given, they are facing it every day. The urgency is there, the, you know, the politics, the governments have to talk about climate when they're being elected. So, uh, so there, is, there is no way you can, you, there is no point, I mean, there is not a need to convince them they are, they are more convinced than we can imagine. So they are ready for action. So there, there's a huge potential for, for innovation. And, um, and so that is quite kind of positive. Uh, so we are looking at strategies, how to move from a linear to a circular island metabolism to become more localized, more kind of regenerative, more resource efficient, adaptive and resilient. And so we're actually seeing these systems uh, as a climate adaptation strategy. So how we are also looking at sweet spots where our human well-being is increased with lower resource use. Uh, so finding that sweet spot and uh, also relying more on nature-based solutions. So these are the key. You know, I can say I can summarize what we can learn, but there is so much more. Of course, we can. Uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, over Q and A. But uh, when you go to your next beach vacation, I would recommend. Uh, <laughs> use some of my works. So when you're lying on a hammock, please read some of their stuff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Simran. Um, I would like to invite the three speakers to uh, just to sit up front. So for our discussion so that um, people on the far side as well can can uh, see you and participate. I would just like to say, wow, what a, what a lovely and diverse set of applications of systems thinking and systems theory at different scales we have just heard. And um, while I, I think that maybe it would be good if we could start asking the three speakers to reflect 
on what they noticed about the other person, uh, the other two two uh, talks that relates and pulls together. Um, and then if we have questions from people here or people online, we have a few minutes to uh, to discuss those. Oh, thank you. Whoa, <laughs> nice. We can see each other. Um, so why don't you start, Stuart? Do you have any comments about uh, the others? What, did, what, what, what occurred to you from these things? Well, so much about the island's perspective, because islands are such a natural unit of regeneration. There we go. So yeah, so much from your wonderful talk, Simran, around islands, because it's a very natural unit of regeneration, if you will. So this nexus of what are the cultural narratives for an archipelago or an individual island? What, what's our kind of strategic direction? Do we want to continue to be heavily resource dependent? What will that mean for constantly being on the very edge of the next crisis? What could it mean to become more circular more resilient over time? Could that actually generate a different kind of prosperity, a, a increased quality of life? Um, so that, you know, that really resonates. And that's something that, that really, you know, bioregions around the world need to address. And so you could be an island, you could be an isolated valley in the Amazon. You know, you could be a place that has kind of its own integrity and you have to ask these very important questions. What do we want to keep taking from outside? What do we want to you know, add value to as a bioeconomy locally. And then kind of seeing that in the hospital. I mean, that was a theme in your talk too, if you think of the hospital as a unit of regeneration. Again, high quality of life, delivering great services while reducing the material through. Go ahead, Miles. Anything? In Stuart's talk, Stuart, you said uh, when you're talking about the. Was that okay. Uh, Stuart mentioned the phrase um, simple, happy, abundant lives. I got that right. <laughs> Maybe I got the order wrong. And I just thought, like, why can't we live simple, happy lives? Mm -hmm. And that is so much a part of the problem in today's society. So I, I really did enjoy the timeline that you showed, as much as it's painful to watch as well. And so that's clearly what we're trying to do is reverse that mm. today. Mm. And um, yeah, and then in terms of the islands, it, it, it occurs to me, the islands are just seeing things happen much faster than mm -hmm. the continents, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. of course, the writing's on the wall. Mm. But, but no, but I, but I do, I do, truly, I do, I do, <laughs> it'll be the communist next, oh no. <laughs> no I, I do, I mean, I think to do this sort of work, you, you have to remain optimist, you have to stay optimistic, and uh, um, I, I was, I was thinking about, again, the islands being part of our global supply chain economy, and uh, you might understand better than me how they, they fit in with everything else. But I, I mean, the fact that we are pushing now to have green products and, and how that ripples around the world and impacts economies around the world is, is probably the thing I have the biggest hope for. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that those, you know, both your talks were really very inspiring and the message of hope and um, also uh, reinforcing, you know, looking back at our roots and you know, indigeneity and, and the practices and the, and the connection, this relationship uh, to land and the examples that you showed were really powerful. Um, and, um, and, and, and also your work, uh, Mike, about, you know, this is really, as a, as a medical doctor who, who also has to wait in the waiting room, uh, uh, which, uh, Thanks for sharing. It's very reassuring. So um, <laughs> that you are that I mean the kind of work that you're doing beyond the call of duty, right? So you're um, um, like how you can not only just look at your work, but how you can try to transform the health system to be more sustainable. And um, and the figures I wasn't aware of those numbers of the magnitude about the different 
um, ways what you know where do we need to focus you know the you know that pie chart was was uh, yeah was quite telling so I think that's so on one side putting things in perspective you know from the universe to the to the hospital um, at the same time uh, not losing um, that message of hope and you know, uh, as you said, uh, we have to keep going all of the time, right? Your last uh, <laughs> quote uh, from, uh, I forgot the name of Angela that. Davis. Yeah, Angela <laughs> Davis, yeah, that was really very beautiful. Thanks, thanks. I wonder if anyone in the audience are, uh, would like to um, make a comment, yes? Uh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Lila is a, an elder who is joining us for the for the CANSI conference and has been with us for the three the three days or since the the first day, and I'm so pleased that you have comments. Yeah. Um, I speak in layman terms, like I'm not uh, I'm a university graduate from Laurier, got my master's at the age of sixty two. <laughs> 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 so what I'm what I'm going to share with you is from a personal perspective. You know, in regards to, uh, um, I can't remember your name in the middle. Stuart. Okay, Stuart, um, the pictures that you've shown, you know, but we call them Mother Earth, you know, and we see the, the destruction that's happening, you know, and, uh, and then the, I, I traveled a lot in the First Nations, you know, and through the way that I did that was by, uh, was by, I'm a public speaker and I talk about residential school and I'm gonna to touch on that tomorrow. I'm not gonna take over the whole rest of the night sharing my story and stuff like that. But what I wanted to comment on was uh, as far as the indigenous people go, you know, we, we fight for mother earth. We have these rallies, you know, um, we uh, get very vocal about what's happening out there, you know, and uh, with the pollution and, and uh, so then people like Suncor, you know, offer us money, you know, the First Nations people, especially in Southern Ontario. And uh, they accept the money, but yet they're protesting, you know? And I don't get that, you know, because I'm not originally, I live in, in uh, Sarnia, but I see, you know, like what is it, about 14, 15 chemical plants there? You know, and then I think, why are they accepting the money? If they really are against this, if they really want to save Mother Earth, you know, stand up, say something, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and so I get kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, labeled, I guess, because I'm a skeptic, right, you know? And I, and I question that because I do stand against that, you know? I do agree with this gentleman here who was talking about the medical system, you know, and I fight with that, you know, and, and uh, somebody asked me one day, would you like to get into politics? I said, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, because uh, what I talk about is, is from a personal perspective, you know, and I see mother dying, you know, and I see man destroying it, you know, and, uh, so I do whatever I can by being vocal about, about that. And that's all I can do, you know, as, a, as an indigenous person and as an individual. So I just wanted to share that. I don't know why, but I just had to bring that out and share that. So thank you for giving me space to do that. Maybe I should. Thank you. It's a good question. We have choices. Why do we make the choices we do, right? Um, comments, yes. Hi, hi, thank you all for your wonderful presentation. So thoughtful and inspiring. Um, I, I loved uh, Dr. Miles, if I remember your name. Uh, I, I, I loved what you said about, you know, making infographics that are for three or four year olds because actually they're so effective. And actually my, my question is really structured more around that because, you know, not all of us are, you know, medical doctors or complexity scientists or, or study metabolic, you know, cycles of violence. And so in, in some sense, it feels as if you've, um, you know, made 
these complex fields very much more accessible. Um, how do you find you know, your work resonating uh, with your stakeholders or constituents or, or other you know, folks that are interacting with your work? And are you finding that it's kind of making it easier for them to engage in what you know, otherwise might seem kind of inaccessible field of you know, saving the planet to uh, reflect the previous speaker? Is this one working? Sounds like it's working. Is it on? Yep. So one of my mentors within this field, her name is Linda, and you can find her on the, a couple of the websites that I've listed, uh, Peach Help Ontario and the Canadian Coalition. She's been doing this for 30 years. She had the frustration of 30 years, 25 years ago, of knocking on hospital doors and no one was interested. And, and green was a paint color. Uh, whereas now, if you talk to her, we feel like we're being hit by a fire hose. There's so much interest. So that, that's a wonderful thing. Um, it's, it's also for us a, a bit of a complicated thing because um, you know everybody wants to make their own toolkit now. <laughs> so we're just trying to keep people aligned and thinking the same way. And, 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 and let people know, actually, we want to make a, essentially like a yellow pages on, on one of the websites to sort of say, uh, yes, cardiology already has a toolkit and rheumatology is doing this. And uh, this is what you can do in a lab. Uh, there's just a ton going on right now, which is great. I want to give a, a shout out to an Ontario native. Some of you might know the work of Bruce Mao, grew up in Sudbury. He was deeply influenced by Sudbury being a fairly extractive place. Growing up, he would see the rivers running red. And um, he has become a world-renowned systemic designer. He invented a whole new kind of graphic design. Some of you probably know, and has gone on to help work on branding for entire nations. And his latest work is trying to reach 100 million life-centered designer. So trying to create a really accessible way. He's an incredible communicator. So he's, his big heart project now is trying to reach 100 million people and give them very rapid access in an exciting, playful way to, be, to realize they are, or all designers always, wake them up to that and also help them become life-centered designers. And um, spending some time with, with Bruce, I was experimenting with extremely simple slides at the beginning. And uh, he kind of uses the like giant, a giant typeface in a simple phrase. I don't know if it worked at all, but I, I will tell you that I, if you go with one thing, the emotional heart of that presentation was we have to admit, we have to admit, right? It's, it's just, it's really difficult to go there and, and really question worldviews and can we tinker around the edges or do we have to make a fundamental shift? And just really, if we, it's very healing to actually begin to say, yeah, we can admit that. Okay, well, that actually opens up all these design spaces, right? It can be so different, but we have to talk about it. And I've been in a long journey. I started with much more sustainability thinking. It didn't have to connect with all of these huge inequity issues and the history of colonization. And after 25 years in this field, I can't work anymore without seeing that deep interlock that we have to address injustice and we have to address the, the impacts of colonization. And that's in the latest IPCC report. It's a very strong statement that says we cannot address climate change without understanding the historic inequities. So there's an, a space opening up. <laughs> Oh, okay. Would, they, would you like to read them? Okay. Um, so we've got. Um, no, but we have to for, the, for, the, for them to hear. Just gonna. Um, so so Mer Mer that's what I mean. That's not gonna work. You talk. <laughs> So maybe um, we can't hear me now because I'm muted. But oh. um, well then, you're going to question. Um, 
Mike's not on, there it's on, primarily for Stuart. Um, in thinking about the kinds of radical multi-scale transitions that were described, uh, how can these theories of change account for the fact that there could be stubborn resistance by incumbent cultural, economic, political powers, as well as the persistence of institutions following exploitative models? So yeah. how do you deal with resistance? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a really powerful question around systems change. Um, we have no choice but to work at that level of immense systems change and the level of resistance is epic and unbelievable in every nation, in every sector, in every university. We, ha we have to keep doing this every day and it will be your unique way of doing it, right? It's gonna be your life, your life force and how you're connecting with the possibility of a more beautiful world and what you can do to gradually unlock whatever cage is around someone's heart that they feel so connected to a dying world that they can't let it go. There was a follow-on question from the online audience about how would you map a set of regenerative goals, Stuart? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll give you a chance to respond. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thinking about regenerative specific, goals. Specific, yeah, generative yeah. goals. Yeah, so I, I kind of touched on just playfully, you know, we have the SDGs. Look, they're incredible. The, the effort it took to get a global consensus on the 17 SDGs was extraordinary. The two women that did this work recently wrote a book that you should read, but it's... <laughs> anyway, there's, there's a recent book kind of on that whole process of cooking up the SDGs. So just playfully, a number of people are beginning to suggest like the RDGs, right? And specifically like the SDGs keep that going. They're very much national level, like the, like the NDCs for climate, they're national efforts, right? To hit those SDGs and all 239 metrics, great. But what if we also kind of playfully say, what if the islands, you know, what if, all these different regional efforts can have their own bottom up RDGs. And it's okay that they're different in different places. So there's a lot of work now in community based indicators, community based evaluation, that part of any regenerative effort is actually just deep listening for a long time to understand well, what, what is emerging? What is the strategic direction for a community? And it can be so different the things that are important, the ways you talk about them, the ways that you measure them can be so different and that's okay. So uh, RDGs that are very diverse and playful and, and reflect very different cultural contexts. Right, and that puts the whole um, idea of scaling something up and applying it across the whole world to, right, no, right. no, 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 no. <laughs> we have right. another comment here. Thanks for your talks. Um, so this panel was called Planetary Accountability and it started with talking like we have to admit that colonialism and, and the colonial mindset is a part, part of the root of ruining the planet. And then, you know, we looked at small island states bearing the brunt of, of that crisis while we have these incredibly polluting medical systems, extending the lives of people in rich nations. And, and I guess my question to all three of you is that I didn't, that I didn't hear too much in your talk is where's the accountability? Like, what do, what do we do about it? How, like y'all have shown really, really compelling ways forward, but where, how do we like atone for account for what's been what's been done, the harm that's already been done. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, in, in the context of uh, say it's the small islands, uh, a lot of discussion is going on since the last COP on loss and damage. And uh, it's become a huge topic I was in Montreal last week uh, for this Adaptation Futures meeting. And so 
is uh, there's there's uh, to link the limits to adaptation and because you know adaptation is we talked about is like it seems like it's the way out of everything but there's also limits to that and so the discussion is going towards loss and damage and to climate finance and who pays uh, also the historical debt you know so um so, so that is so that is on the table it's a very very hot topic and that's on the table in ter terms of the historical accountability the, the you know the ecological debt the um, um like um how does you know who who pays um for that and going forward uh so this these definitions are there uh, it took a long time to actually um kind of acknowledge this so it's not it didn't come easily this discussion because it in fact small island states have been fighting uh to be noticed uh you know they've, they've applied for for a long time uh, in the cops and, and international um, agendas they are now becoming more visible they're more acknowledged and and they think it's a big win to have that on the table but there is still a way to go um it's not that we have resolved it but the fact that it is a core and a very important discussion it's uh, i think that's one step uh, uh, in response to the accountability question uh, when it comes to the small island states. So Phoebe Tickle has been working with the concept of the moral imagination. She's built a center around this. It's a beautiful idea that economics is not value neutral, as I've been arguing tonight. So it, how do we calculate this, right? So ecological economics can actually be really helpful and do some very practical accounting for various kinds of loss and damage that have occurred and so forth. Of course, we can use some numbers and math and estimate things, but the deeper point is processes of reparation, of redistribution, of reconciliation. And it can only happen through very profound intercultural dialogue about restorative justice and what it might mean. And you know, the islands you work with are a great example. Like what might it mean for some of these islands pursuing loss and damages, also often pursuing damages for the slave trade, right? There are multiple kinds of damages over 500 years. There's, I'm a mathematician. There's no number you can ever place on that. It is a moral question. It is not value, value neutral. And you have to open a design space to even understand what kind of cultural dialogue you could have to get to that, to what could feel whole. And it's gonna be a lot of very difficult, messy conversations, but I think they'll start to get easier. The important thing is enormous amounts of capital have to move right away. Enormous amounts of land need to be rematriated right away, period. And so there'll be a hundred different ways to get to that. And it has to happen all over the world right now. Stuart, oh, Stuart's a poet, so yeah. it's, tough to, <laughs> it's tough to follow up. I loved your question. You sort of summarized all three lectures there in, in, your, in your question. So I will speak about the, the healthcare side that you mentioned. And, and you're right, it's, it's, it's incredible what we do. Uh, I have a colleague who's um, just put out a book about, um, I suppose, advanced care planning in the way we think as a society about death about our own death about loved ones and that when someone's sick we demand all these things and, and, and often it is that a loved one has a stroke they can't speak for themselves now the family's speaking for them and the family's saying oh yes they've won everything done and now the person's in hospital for months at a time and so she is looking at this at a societal level and stepping back and saying like, we, we really need to rethink this as a society. It shouldn't just be that crisis moment when you get the phone call and you're at the hospital bed and you're making these decisions. I mean, we should be making these decisions ourselves and with our families long ahead of time, right? Um, yeah, so I think that was probably the main thing. The, the other thing, uh, again, in terms of hope is that some of these challenges that my colleague Linda has been pushing against for years and years, I think I walked into this at the right time that people are ready for change. And there's things a year ago that people said would never happen. And we're starting to see them happen. 
you know, fossil fuels, uh, divesting from fossil fuels would be one of them. And you do see a lot of the universities now divesting from fossil fuels and municipalities divesting from fossil fuels. And so why wouldn't hospital foundations do the same? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this will have to be our last uh, comment or intervention because time is uh, go move marching on and we need to uh, get out of here, but anyway. Uh, I just want to thank you all for the deep work that you're doing. It's extremely encouraging, first and foremost, so thank you. Um, and the question that I have is around human factors. You've been at this for decades. You've talked to thousands of people. What are the human factors, or let's say the number one human factor that you see for the willful blindness or that cage around the heart? Like, what are we actually dealing with as the human kind of thought process or feelings process that's missing. Well, so yeah, that's that's a, a wonderful question. You know, what is that human factor that makes it so difficult to just look directly at this polycrisis, right? It's the climate crisis, it's biodiversity, it's water, it's inequity, it's all of us hitting us. And part of it is cognitively, right? We're wired for a lot of like very short term, you know, uh, responses at best thinking a few years ahead. And I honestly think that's, that's the main issue as a species. We have to work very consciously to think many generations ahead. And I believe that many indigenous cultures actually very deliberately created systems to do that because it's easy to just kind of crash into the next day or the next year with the busyness of life. And you need to set aside time in council to say, where are we going many generations from now? And I think that's what helps sustain many of those cultures. There may be something about islands too, mm -hmm. where people know each other, people know, you know the impacts, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible to see each other as different, but part of the same community, right? When you're in an island. I don't know, Sister Ryan, anything yeah. else? Yeah? Miles? That is an extremely tough question. Mm -hmm. And uh, psychologists think about this. And I remember someone telling me there's, you know, there's 20 different psychological reasons why, why humanity is not taking this on in the way they should. Um, I also think about the, the concept that if someone grows up on a farm or playing in the woods, they're more likely to be an environmentalist. I think we, you know, with big cities, maybe we've lost a bit of that. And I think maybe loss of community, the way we've had community in the past as well, uh, and, and, and knowing how to come together and take something on which is bigger than yourself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our speakers. <laughs>